All right. Hello again. You're listening to Overthrowing the Network State, um, a special podcast series from the Blockchain Socialist. And I'm here again with the High Priestess Primavera de Filippi. Um, and we have a special guest. He is probably one of the biggest names or the biggest brains in crypto. Um, but uh, I think like your, um, uh, your fame doesn't follow the size of your brain. So I'm glad that uh, uh, I get to uh, post this uh, interview with you. Um, his name is Michael Zargum. He is the founder of Block Science. He's a PhD uh, from Penn in Electrical and Systems Engineering. And he works mainly as a systems engineer and solutions engineer. So um, I've had some really interesting conversations with him in the past about cybernetics, about complex, complex systems. And um, yeah, you're like one of, the, one of the best people to talk about it that, that I've found that's been able to kind of um, succinctly and crisply explain very, very complex ideas to a, a poo-poo brain like me. Um, but today's focus is going to be about the network states. And um, maybe uh, I would like to start with just knowing kind of like your initial thoughts on the network state, especially coming from uh, a systems engineering background. Um, well, I will say that when I saw the name of the book, I got really excited because I was thinking, oh, networks, like, you know, resources distributed, spatially separated, politically decentralized, et cetera. And then I started reading the book and I was kind of like, oh, this is just sort of like highly centralized, sort of neo-feudal, uh, I don't know. I, I, I gotta say, like, it didn't really resonate with me, even though I thought that it might. And so, you know, digging into it a bit more, you just kind of come to this place where, and I know we talked about this earlier on the podcast, that it's sort of an ideological um, treatise. And I think that there's a lot of benefit to overthrowing the network state or sort of reclaiming some of this language, because I think there are ideas that could be associated with some of these concepts that are maybe more salient, even more more feasible or more implementable. Nice, yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so one of the things, um, or one of the comments that I've gotten a lot uh, lately um, about this series is like, oh, you know, I really, um, I really like it when you guys talk about the uh, sort of alternatives or what, what people I think like to um, be positive about, uh, or like they like to hear positive things about the future, um, and so I want to um, base this conversation on thinking about that, on how we can sort of expand upon, or uh, like you say, uh, or overthrow the sort of ontology that the network state gives us, but capture the things that uh, I think people are resonating with, at least in the beginning, um, when they first hear the term network state, and begin to build out kind of uh, what these type of alternative systems could look like. Yeah, so, let's, oh, oh, so let's start with some of the, the, the positive sort of initial evocations, right? So you hear network and you start to think about things as being um, more distributed, ideally more localized. So I have a, you know, an a environment in which I can participate and that I feel enfranchised, that I'm more aligned with the other members potentially. Um, and I think that he does kind of lean into that. He just takes it to this extreme where you, you sort of imagine a, um, a universe where like everyone around you is exactly like you and you sterilize the relationships with people who don't 100% agree with you. And I don't think that that's very realistic. I think for starters, like, you know, I have a family, like I had to move home to where I grew up in order to have support for my daughter when I have to travel for work, when my wife has to travel for work. And if I start to look at the set of quote unquote infrastructures or, you know, that, that I rely upon both social and technical, the set of functions that need to exist in and around me in order for me to, you know, function as an individual, to function as a family unit, to function as a part of a community or in ideally many communities that, that I'm part of, um, I get a very bit different picture of the world as something that's inherently more networked, inherently more interconnected, not quite so, um, you know, I might jump into a different sterile box in Balaji's ontology, but ultimately you're sort of choosing between a bunch of very rigid boxes rather than having like a more organic, interconnected or like ecological relation between the various communities that um, 
both provide and consume uh, the set of functions that we might call a society. So a network society doesn't have the same kind of um, rigidity or sterile sterility that I think the, the network state ontology has. And I think I think it goes back to uh, this is one of the claim that we keep claiming, uh, but we're going to repeat it once again to try and build something out of that. Um, this is kind of the 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 general one of the big criticisms that uh, we encounter of uh, if you're if you're based on this exit based approach, then you do have to exit from one place in order to enter into an, into another place, and so you're actually extremely limiting the capacity of not just interconnection, but the capacity of like layering and uh, benefiting from an existing infrastructure while also building yet another infrastructure. Um, and so if, if, we, if we're trying to like in, to think more in, the, in a constructive manner, um, so what are the modalities that do not involve exit and yet that actually brings this more networked mechanism yeah. Uh, of dependence, of interdependence, and of collective action without necessarily having to exclude ourselves from the existing infrastructures that uh, uh, many different institutions are already working to provide. Yeah. I, I mean, the thing to double down on, too, is this idea that that exit costs are, are low or should be low. They, they can't be low. The truth is that once you have a family and once you have a certain amount of, let's say, entanglement with the, with the world around you, that like low exit costs is tantamount to actually not having that relationship. So the moment that you forego this sterilization and try to embrace, quote unquote, the complexity of the real world, you're going to get, you're no longer going to be able to operate within this assumption that exit costs should be arbitrarily small. And even in the physical world equivalent of the network state where people are voting with their feet, exiting one jurisdiction to go to another, you can examine things like the Free State Project, which involves people migrating to New Hampshire and then like largely advocating and lobbying in the state of New Hampshire for more libertarian ideals. That's the closest thing that I know of to the, the sort of just exit where you are and move to this other place. And that, A, comes with high exit costs for the families that I do know who moved to New Hampshire. It wasn't, um, it wasn't easy. It's expensive to move across country. And two, um, even once they get there, they, they don't actually agree on everything. It's not like New Hampshire is some perfect, idealized, libertarian state. I mean, their motto is live free or die, and there's some interesting events around the libertarian ideals, but ultimately it's still a member of the United States of America. It has only a certain amount of you know states' rights, and although it would generally advocate for more states' rights, even the libertarians there don't have unilateral control over the state's decision making. So the, in practice, the thing that exists that's like this doesn't work at all like the story that's being told. Terms and conditions may apply <laughs> when you uh, go to New Hampshire. Um, one, one thing to, I think is like, uh, so there's the important point about exit cost. Uh, but I think there's another point that I would like to add into the conversation, which is the um, the, I don't know, bootstrapping cost or the re, re, rebuilding from scratch cost. Uh, because again, if, if, it's, if it's about exit, not only it needs to be easy to exit from a particular system, but you also need to, need to be able to go to a new system where the cost of actually rebuilding the whole infrastructure <laughs> necessary in order to actually create a society are also not completely exacerbated uh, because then you're exiting to what? You're exiting to a place where there is, in fact, no existing infrastructure and who is going to take care of this infrastructure? Right. Yeah, and I think the, the in question of infrastructures is actually the right one. So, like, let's take another concrete infrastructure, not just necessarily the societal infrastructure of a state, like, 
New Hampshire, but something like an internet service provider. Like it's extremely difficult to exit your ISP because you have a physically entrenched monopoly on the wires that move the bits around. Um, there are places where people didn't have internet or didn't have good internet where they've built cooperatives that maintain mesh networks. Um, I believe there's one in the Berkshires in, in uh, Massachusetts um, that a friend of mine is uh, participating in. And it, it's pretty cool, but it's a lot of work, right? Like you still have to build, operate, maintain, and govern that infrastructure. And again, this is just one function. When we start to talk about like society, both socially and technically, there are you know, dozens, maybe arguably hundreds of kinds of day-to-day um, -day hidden, invisible activities that that um, that create the experience of society that we have. And if you're abstracted far enough away from those things, it's easy to forget how much labor by how many people in how many different institutions actually goes to design, develop, operate, maintain, and govern all of the things that you rely upon on a day-to-day -day basis. And these aren't products. It's not the consumer apps in front of you. They're the um, they're the the infrastructures like the roads and the power grid and the internet and your water supply and you know, you know then God forbid you get into things like the economic policy making. I recently had a, a great um, I had a guest from uh, the Power Authority here giving a lecture at an unconference we hosted it, talking about all of the not just technical work, but the policy making that goes into ensuring that the the power grid remains stable, sharing resources, you know, within across zones and even across national borders. And again, there's sort of this presupposition that all of these things could be sterilized, disjointed, and provisioned independently. Um, when it, in reality, they're um, they're again they're quite entangled. One of the kind of funny thought experiments I've I've had is like, what? How do you handle these types of societal things, this type of infrastructure, in like a, you know, say you're in the keto network states? How do you handle roads in a keto way? If like you know, network states are built on this one commandment, like what kind of weird things can pop out of, like I don't know, keto extremists wanting like very specific things in like you know their architecture that that. Uh, or infrastructure that uh, may or may not be feasible and what types of uh, disagreements that could allow? Well, I mean, ul ultimately, okay, the, the keto network state as, as would be still physically distributed. So unless you created a sufficiently large keto municipality in every location that it manifested in, you would where it started to have the capacity to provision its own infrastructures, it would necessarily be relying on, on other network states to provide. So let's just take this from a software analogy for a moment. Imagine that the network state is like kind of like each network, each network state within this system is a microservice. And that microservice has some endogenous and some exogenous functions, meaning it serves itself, that's its endogenous, like it has its one commandment and, you know, everyone in the keto network state has these, you know, keto rules that they follow and they choose to be part of it. But then, okay, what does the keto network state export? Like how does it, what does it, what does it do to serve the rest of this networked economy so that it can receive, you know, food like, like literally unless it's growing its own food maybe it's a farming commune i don't know but uh, how about internet how about power how about water where do they come from well in principle it needs a tr positive trade balance so it's got to export something so if i'm a keto network state member software developer then it, where does my computer come from, the power, et cetera? And then what work do I do? And am I a contractor to a different network state? Is, is, my, is my network state have members who are there for solidaristic reasons, like being keto or, or vegan or whatever? Like It starts to get a little shaky when you try to look at imports and exports. Um, so I don't know if that, that's helpful. I, 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 my imagination is a little different. It's one where, uh, back to the... Um, microservices analogy, um, any any particular, uh, let's call it subsid, like unit of, of uh, unit of solidarity needs to be able to consider both its 
internal needs and its its external um, its external needs or its relations amongst itself and its relationships with others, and that even insofar as we do produce these communities of of, of solidarity, um, we need not. Um, situate each individual in exactly one. Because I could, for example, be a member of a solidaristic unit that's, um, I don't know, associated with my particular religious beliefs or my, my dietary preferences, et cetera, or both, and also, also be in the constituency of, um, of a, let's say, call it a nation instead of a state that's focused on Engineering. I like to talk a lot about the social institution of engineering. I feel a deep attachment to this lineage of engineers as stewards of technology for the benef- betterment of society. I mean, my, my dad's a civil engineer, my uncle's an architect, my grandfather's a structural engineer. And so, like, I come from a family that sort of gave me that association. And my formal education is four engineering degrees. And so I am pretty. <laughs> So you're part of the engineering. I am nation. quite literally part of <laughs> like, but but I actually that, that's not a joke. Like I feel a very strong set of set of attachment to a set of engineering nationalists yeah, who are. of of ideas, and, and and I can, but that one I can provide as a service, right? Even if I'm also right, right. part of these other other segments that are you know more belief oriented or you know. You know, religious or dietary, or I'm also part of the ultimate Frisbee nation. I played ultimate Frisbee for a decade, but like only the engineering one is actually an export where I, I'm like delivering value and then hopefully importing value to meet my needs. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I, have a, I have a few uh, questions here because on the one hand like it feels that the way in which um you're describing things right now is that uh whatever is these new creatures that uh, that we're trying to elaborate uh conceptually is kind of like you it looks like you're um you're applying some kind of functional approach uh rather than Balaji's actual territorial approach to the network state. And uh so you 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 might have different people that aggregate around a particular function and then they might become this kind of like digital digital guild or something. Uh, I'm wondering whether even that is is like not um too functionally oriented. Uh because in some way like yeah, you know, I, I think we are all part of many tribes. Uh, we can call them as we like, but like communities and things like that, digital or local communities. And it's not really like, I actually don't really have an interest in being part of a tribe in which we are all, uh, you know, engineers or all artists. It's actually, there is, it's more, a, for me, it's more like this shared vision of society. And, uh, and it's the more variegates, in fact, the, the people and the functions and the and their passions and their job, whatever. Um, the more variegated those are, the more interesting this community gets. Uh, but we are all aligned together because we have a particular commonality in the vision of how we want society to be. Perhaps we also want to engage into some type of collective action around a particular uh, societal issue. Perhaps we want to share resources in common. Uh, but I almost think that just like I believe that the Balaji is uh, geographical and mono, <laughs> monothematic notion of network state is, is lacking this concept of interdependencies and things like that. I feel like the functional approach is uh, clearly way more interesting than uh, than Balaji's approach, but it, it, it might also lack a little bit of what we might consider that w- what we want to qualify as a nation. To me, this is more like this is a guild. This is like um, this is a, a community of people that are doing a particular things, and maybe they need to like cooperate and, and collaborate between each other. But but when we're talking about like combination, coordination, I don't know what the name of those things is, is like, don't we actually, um, like, w- what is the, the line of discernment that uh, make it wants to be part of the same nation. Yeah. So, so let me let me make a, an additional clarification. So we were focused on these type of breakdowns that um, we just discussed because we were kind of building from Balaji's ontology. But let's like let's break that for a second and just give give away 
Balaji and let's talk about somebody like um, sort of Stafford Beer has this quote, all systems are simultaneously decentralized and centralized just in different dimensions. I butchered it. You can look it up exactly. But in a sense, when we say that it's both centralized and decentralized at the same time, and it's a question of what dimensions, we're just asking like, where are the variations and where are the similarities? So if we want to align a bunch of people, artists and engineers and you know, whatever, like all different kinds of people who do different kinds of things have different backgrounds. They're extremely diverse around a set of, let's say, preferences about, you know, how, um, you know, how, what we value and, and what kind of change we want to see in the world. That's centralizing around a set of, let's say, I, I, ideological or like formative precepts that we would work against, an animating purpose, if you will. And then there's a lot of variety in the, the constituents in many ways. Um, but alternatively, we could take, um, again, I'll take like an, an engineering um, organization, which could contain a bunch of people who have very similar skills, but maybe they have very different political leanings and preferences. And so there's like a, there's a slice that is aligned in one dimension and misaligned in others. And when I think about the fabric of society, it's like all of these different slices in lots of different directions. They're not orthogonal. They're intersecting and thus meaningfully entangled. Might have a non-trivial topology, but, but, but ultimately um, it's not as simple as just slicing things into functions or slicing them into political slices or slicing them by any dimension. Yeah, it reminds me of like a, almost like a market segmentation. <laughs> Like it's something that you would do in like market research for trying to develop a product, like a technological product, um, doing it in that way. It's very much a maps and territories problem. You're mistaking the map for the territory. The territory is this rich, entangled, organic thing. And then we impose a map on it that slices it up into nice, clean grid lines. And then we talk about the map. As long as we remember that we can have lots of different maps, they're all different projections of the same rich territory, then it's fine to use the maps. Just we should be careful about substituting the map for the territory. Right. Um. So moving to this uh, question about infrastructure again, um, I'm interested if you have any thoughts, because you're taking this more, I guess, functional approach, um, how do you think a, something like a coordination or a communication or you know, whatever like new meme we want to create uh, for our alternative to the network state, how should it uh, or how could it handle uh, infrastructure in a way that is not sort of in the way that sort of nation states handle infrastructure today? Yeah, so I guess the first question is actually what functions should your coordination provide you? Like, is the coordination ontology rich enough to be the, um, I guess you could call it the, the source of an anti-state socialism instead of a state socialism, in which case we would have to articulate all of the functions that society serves its members and then ask if there is a way to provision them all using um, uh, this coordination uh, model. And I would say that that's actually probably plausible, but it's a pretty big step change in the way that society works. So maybe a more stepwise approach would be to just identify, excuse me, um, I would be to identify specific functions and then asking what it would look like for um, a a coordination to, to service them. And for me, um, if I talk about social infrastructures, these are the ones that um, are the most underserved in, in Balaji's ontology. So, um, for example, like infrastructures of care. I said earlier, I moved home after my daughter was born or moved back to where I grew up. Why? Because there is a social infrastructure present. My sister, my parents, friends I've known since high school who also have kids. And so there was an extent to which living anywhere else failed to afford me a particular social infrastructure that was required for raising a family. Things like, hey, oh no, I had this big client deliverable come up. I'm going to have to work late tonight. Can you watch my daughter? Well, sure, there's a market solution. I could look up care.com and get a random stranger 
honestly, but it's a a strictly inferior good because with regards to care of my daughter, a market solution is inferior by definition. And so like, um, you know, reasoning about these more informal institutions and the extent to which they fulfill um, functions in society that that I rely upon um, is is pretty interesting. If we if we start to think about those as um, things that get fulfilled by social infrastructures, we can start to extrapolate learnings from these technical infrastructures and to the extent to which they're um, operated, maintained, governed, cared for, that they provide for functions that people need in their lives to um, something more like the social dimension. Um, Again, I I think that we need some geographic locality. And I'm not the first person to bring up the idea of a a local first um, coordination as the anchor for anybody who has real life entanglements. And then my my ageographic coordinations have things in common like you know, Metagov, which is an organization I'm involved with, uh, with P, which is a rich network of people with, with some similar research interests and, you know, building stuff and learning, uh, very much I feel that as a, as a uh, we could call it an infrastructure for my, for my research interests and for my um, sort of some of my professional work. Uh, but it's fundamentally distinct from the set of infrastructures that are geographic in nature that that serve my my physical needs and sort of the needs of my family. Um, yeah, I think you're saying something that uh, I really like to hear, um, which is like to me like the the important question that need need to be tackled um, when we're discussing about those new those new entities uh, is like why why are they needed and what is it that currently is not satisfied, not satisfying us? Why, why is there this resonance? And I think there are two degrees. There is, on one hand, the fact that the existing forms of institutions are perhaps uh, over, uh, um, uh, over colonizing, taking too much space and preventing people from doing some things. And then the opposite side is uh, they are actually not providing enough of what we want. Um, and I think Balaji is probably about they are taking too much space. And uh, I think we might be more on the direction of like, there is actually quite a gap. And I think what is interesting is that there is clearly a gap uh, where the state is not providing and the market is not providing. Or maybe they are providing, but they are not providing the most effective or in the most optimal way. And uh, and I think that's where it makes sense to intervene and propose something new, which is not in the sense of, hey, I don't like what you're doing, state, let me move away. And then I'll have to do everything again. And it's going to be just as lame (laughs) as what the current state is doing, if not worse, because I actually have to redo it. Uh, Or um, it's, it's about like, hey, let's actually recognize what the state is providing and let's recognize what the market is providing. And those are two very powerful institutions that we should also respect for the things that are provided to us. But there is also a gap. There is like, we believe, I think, that there is many things that could be done in a better manner, in a more enjoyable manner, in a more collective manner. Um, If we were not relying exclusively on the public infrastructure of the state and are on the private infrastructure of the market. And I think that's where this this idea of coordination, combination comes about, where there is actually more value, as you say, when you have people from your tribes that are taking care of your kid rather than purchasing the service of a nanny that that you don't really have a relationship with. And 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 to me it is this kind of this this particular gap that uh, that justifies at least this uh, this trying to elaborate something else, and in this sense, it's very different from I think the underlying motivation of Balaji's with the network state, which is more let's escape from the constraints that existing state infrastructure are providing. So and, this and third sector. We, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Well, so this no, this sort just, of. Just, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, just just to finish, uh, <laughs> I was just saying like because I think because we are seeing this as a gap as opposed to as a need to escape, then it makes much more sense that we want to build upon it and in an interdependent manner because actually 
there are some things that are already provided by the state and the market. Let's add to them and let's fill up this gap that we are filling and that we believe we can fill up with collaborative, collective action from this combination. Yeah, I'm 100% on board. We're also not the first people to discuss this, and I'm sure you're not surprised. I, a friend of mine, uh, Sarah Horowitz, recently wrote a book called Mutualism. I think it, it's uh, similarly articulating this gap. And I think one of the things that really stands out about discussing this gap is that uh, both the state and the market are extremely impersonal institutions. They operate at scale. In fact, they, they even you could say that a modern society fetishizes scale. You're not successful until the thing you've made is scaled. And the truth is that when you're dealing with some of this more, let's say, family-related stuff, like Scale is not an attribute you want. You want personalness. You want relationships. You want things that, by definition, do not scale. And so, in this third sector, in the um, the part of the economy that is just more personal in nature, it, it's by definition, it's your you know local community, it's your family, it's the people that you have relationships with, or you know maybe two hop relations where there's still a much tighter knitness. Um, I kind of associate this with the, the sector of the economy that, that Putnam talks about declining in bowling alone. It's like there's this, this thing that happened in the last century where we got sort of fixated on these scalable institutions and that we sort of lost this um, sort of let's say, evaluation of these more personal, more local institutions. And so I view DAOs, this coordination thing, uh, Sarah's work on the Mutualist Society, and every other manifestation of this as this deep need for humans to have personal relationships and community groups with whom they have non-scalable relationships. And that when we build new infrastructures, we should be building them such that they support these kinds of more localized, more personal relationships and not simply assume that things are good if and only if they are extremely scalable. Moving away from maximal efficiency towards sufficiency and then allowing the, the details, the variations to proliferate and just have a generally more biodiverse institutional fabric will lead to a, a richer set of choices for everyone and thus ideally more fulfilling lives for people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, uh, it's also related with like technology in the sense that um, all of Sudan, these type of collective uh, communities, whatnot, um, we actually now have the, ab uh, the ability, not necessarily to scale in terms of size, but to scale in, si in terms of reach and really finding the people that we, we want to support and the people that want to support us and, and, and therefore like increasing the capacity of action and collective action that those uh, those community can have, while of course the internet is also improving this, the the capacity of the market and of the state. And so, in some way, it's like there there needs to be now this very interesting uh, window of opportunity to try and sneak in um, and try to provide those uh, alternative solutions to things that could very well indeed uh, be responded to from a public or a private perspective, but maybe they don't have the same quality in terms of uh, they are less aligned and they, they have less of this uh, social, uh, social value that comes when you're actually doing things together with the people from your same tribe. Yeah, and so I would say that we have these sort of three big lanes or three big sectors. One's public, one's basically private, the, the market. The, then the other is civic. It's sort of, it's, it's neither public nor private. It's kind of both. It's sort of, you know, these, these localized, um, you know, subsidiary units that are, they share dimensions of solidarity and they, they, they allow people to be expressive. While the market and the state may provide many of the functions needed by individuals, just sort of like reclaiming the space for 
self-actualization, not just at the individual level, but at the small group or community level. Um, but here's the thing. We we're talking about the network state being really um, exciting for people because it's an articulation of a new ontology and it sounds implementable. So we're, we're back to like technologies and building infrastructures to support things. And so at least from my part, and we talked about this a little bit the time that I went on an interview with, with, with um, this podcast before, is design. And design entrenches ontologies. And so if you take the network state and you build the infrastructures that embody it, you are going to get things that have that network state ontology, Bellagio's ontology. So if we want a coordination ontology or a, you know, a civic sector that's both... Um, sufficient in the sense that the needs of people are met and expressive in the sense that it provides them the affordances to discover what value is for them locally amongst their shared tribe members or their members of their community of solidarity, then we need to have a, that ontology fleshed out enough that we can actually build infrastructures to entrench that one instead. Because that this is where like the politics of infrastructure comes from. You you embody in the infrastructure some model of the world. And if you're not really careful about what that model of the world is, you're effectively um, you know, imprinting it. And and maybe you could say that if you're a you know a, a dictator or a would-be, you know, sort of founder in the in the model that Balaji puts forth, you get to be this like local dictator of your own little universe, and then you just try to attract people to your little dictatorship. In 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 my ontology, um that that sort of dictatorship role is something we want to diffuse away. The role of the founder in in the creation of the of the new um, uh, of a new element or a, a new group is not to tell everyone what to do. It's to sort of discover the ontology, to encode it and to build a, an infrastructure or a set of tools that enable a set of activities, but it's a it's a service act, not a um, not one of one of control. Um, but that's a nuance because whenever we look at um, whenever we look at infrastructures, they're simultaneously technolo technologies that empower and control. There's no like strict line that you can place in the sand. You are adding constraints and you are creating opportunities. And exactly how you make your discretionary choices is, is something that is often down to context. And the same decision in one context might be viewed as an imposition, an act of control, and in another, in other contexts, it might be you know, helpful and enabling. And I don't think that you can pull that question out and say, it's always okay to you know, do this and not that. Um, it's a sort of no free lunch scenario, which is part of the reason why it's inconvenient for a manifesto like Balaji's work, where they want the one commandment, and you need the right answer. And I, bluntly, I, I don't think the real world works like that. Yeah, and uh, it's also um, it's also very interesting because there is a lot of those uh, sci-fi uh, hyper libertarian. Uh, utopian or dystopian stories, right? Where you have like uh, every every community or every whatever you want to call it, network state and whatnot, uh, they have their own infrastructure. And then all of a sudden you have like 10 different roads because everyone is using the only their one and they don't share with others, right? And so like in some way, like if you think really in the sense of the network state as something that should build all the stack of infrastructure from from physical infrastructure to to social infrastructure, whatever, you just get the most incredible amount of redundancy and it is becomes ridiculous. And therefore, of course, the the necessity, especially because we live in like uh, because we want to live in a world that is not everyone is being secluded in their own little territory. Uh, there is this need of understanding the the common infrastructure, which is shared potentially amongst multiple nation, multiple community, multiple whatever is our name. Um, and and, and this, is, this is fundamental because this also brings about the one thing that Balaji is trying to avoid at all costs, which is, well, if we do have common infrastructure, we also have to manage this common infrastructure as a common between different communities, which might not actually 
have similar ideals and philosophy, and yet they are on the same location, and therefore they need to use the same road or the same bridge. And so politics comes again, right? Like as soon as we, we realize the need and the, and the, it's not a need, it's actually the preference because we don't want to waste resources by building 10 times the same infrastructure, then, then politics come about by their own definition because the commons and the commons management of public and our private infrastructure becomes necessary to find a point of agreement between people that might not fully agree on everything. But there's a logical trap in his argument, which is just that, like, he supposes that if you sufficiently aligned people, they wouldn't find something to argue about. But to me, that's a sheer, like, lack of experience with humans. Like, if you're not in a dictatorial environment where someone just gets to say so, immediately there's disagreements. In fact, I would argue even in an environment where I'm, like, the, the CEO, I actually benefit from creating the space for people to disagree because there's a lot of information in the disagreements. So again, we're talking about this very sterilized, reductive model of the world that is so far away from the world that actually trying to build something as if the world worked like that, like that bridge falls down. If you don't survey the shores, the bridge is going to be connected to and understand the actual depth of the water and the materials on the cliff face, et cetera. And then you go try to build a bridge. It doesn't stand up. And so like this story, it's very truthy. It appeals to people's like, desire for all of their needs to be met beautifully and to not have to argue with anyone about anything ever. But like, it's just not a thing. <laughs> I want to figure out the real thing that, that shares some of that truthiness, not all of it, but like the and truthiness, by the way, is this term for sounds true, feels true. It isn't true, just gives you the sense it, it, it's appealing. You like want it to be true. And so I think that we see a lot of sort of manifesto writing, narrative sort of futuring activities. They reside soundly in the feels true, but is false. Because the real stuff, it's usually a bit more complex, interconnected, less sterile. It's harder to articulate. It's harder to scale back to that scale fetishization, is that if you reduce something enough, you can get lots of people to resonate with it. It's just not real. If you try to face the realities, then you're going to get something that's naturally a little less legible, naturally a little more local, and thus less scalable. And so I think there's a tension here in just the very idea that like we could come up with an, a meme, an alternative meme that is um, competitive with the network state because the network state has already been optimized for a certain kind of receptivity, but it's just not been optimized for reality. So we're, at least in my opinion, we're broaching this trade-off space and saying like, okay, but like we're going to sacrifice a little bit on the, on the raw memetics in favor for like realness and then maybe on a longer time scale it has stronger memetics because it could entrench like it could actually be implemented and people could have firsthand experiences of these outcomes and, and to some extent already do my view on a lot of the the communities that i participate in is that they have a lot more in common with the coordination idea than they do with the network state idea um in a large part because they exist <laughs> um, but uh, Sergio, just, I, I think I might steal that too. Just by curiosity, o optimizing for reality. <laughs> um, what is uh, so? Let's uh, let's let's forget the implementation uh, details slash impossibilities. Um, just to understand from your perspective, what is the things out of the current meme of the network state as described by Balaji. Uh, so what are those components, independently of whether or not they are real, meaning whether or not they can be uh, in man manifested in reality, but even only at the conceptual and um, uh, yeah, at the conceptual layer, like what are the things that you do resonate with and what are the things that you do not resonate with, uh, independently of whether or not they are possible? Sure. So, um, I mean, firstly, just the idea of these communities of solidarity is resonant for me. But what's not resonant for me is having to pick one. So there's like a very stark difference between an intersectionality where I am 
you know, many things at once. I'm, you know, a son and a father and a, you know, a brother and whatnot. So I have my familial relations. I, and then I, I am also a member of a physical constituency where, where I live now. And I've, you know, made an effort to, you know, like pay school taxes and I'm starting to be entangled within my, my local geographic element. I'm a member of, um, and I guess I could go on at this at length. You, we've discussed it already. Very much the the communities of solidarity and being able to define myself in terms of memberships, but 100% many memberships in parallel that serve different aspects of my reality rather than having to pick one dimension, which is somehow magically going to serve all aspects of my needs. Um, I would say that's the probably the most pointed one. Um, otherwise, I, I don't know, man, I'm a founder, so I can sort of resonate with the idea of like building something and kind of having quote unquote control in that regime. But my experience with building block science is sort of opposite. It's that like I am most successful when I when I relinquish control. I, I've worked very hard to create redundancies over myself and to train and educate other people and to create information processing capabilities even within the organization that um, support dissent and turn that dissent into information. And so I, I just don't see the I don't see the benefit of these kind of uh, feudal archetypes. I, I, I'm much more into cooperatives and, and models of human organization that close the loops between those who make decisions and those who are affected by decisions. I, I'm not advocating for like perfect non-hierarchy. I think you need expertise. And in fact, our discussion of technical infrastructures reminds us that we are dependent on a relatively large number of you know, individuals and organizations that are technically expert in fulfilling technical needs. And so we wouldn't flatten that away. We would just, um, we would just factor it apart. We could say that I don't need to trust a specific person. I can trust an institution. That institution fulfills a function. And my main complaint with the modern society is that we have lots of non-functional institutions. Like I'd be happy to see institutions that are incapable of fulfilling their you know, animating purpose fade away, whereas I'd be more than happy to put funding and effort behind uh, organizations that have animating purposes that fulfill societal functions and even invest more in them, you know, improving maintenance of, of roads and bridges, at least here in the U S would be a good investment. Um, but on the other hand, I, I, I struggle to see, for example, the sec as fulfilling its purpose of protecting investors. It does largely seems to be uh, an organization who's trying to grow their power base rather than trying to serve their, um, their function as a protector of investors, which is an important function. And I don't think the function should go away. I'm just questioning whether the institution responsible for that function is actually, actually acting according to that function, which sort of brings us back to another nice Stafford beer quote, which is something along the lines of the purpose of a system is what it does, which is a kind of tongue in cheek jab at systems that claim to be doing one thing but if you actually look at the empirical evidence that you know what they're actually doing in the world is, is quite different from their their stated purpose and so it's tricky um this whole functional decomposition approach just asks this question what what functions are sufficient for a healthy society and what infrastructures and institutions serve those needs and that you know my view of a of a a healthy future society is one where we've identified those things and that we have tried to make sure that everyone receives them. I sometimes call this universal basic affordances, you know, insofar as we can limit the extent to which people need to, um, or like essentially are denied those affordances, but then ultimately leave space for a high degree of self-actualization, both at the individual level, but at the group level, but also at the group level. And it's this, you know, coordination or communication that should, could serve as the franchisable unit of these communities of solidarity, which could be, you know, small, medium, large, it depends on whether they're local and physical space or they're digital. Um, but ultimately, by creating space for more personal institutions for things that 
don't have to be scaled. I think we'll just get a much richer institutional fabric, much uh, better provisioning of social you know, social functions, and um, you know maybe just like foregoing some of this desire to A, scale, and to B, to disentangle. Because again, the sterilization comes from an unwillingness to engage with um, these sometimes stressful, but, but ultimately life processes of you know, debating, deliberating, arguing, discussing, deciding how to share resources. But like, I mean, even nature does a reasonably good job, um, you know, managing the flow of non-fungible resources, you know, nutrients and stuff. You can look at, you know, matter and energy flowing around in natural ecologies. And, you know, those systems, whether you think about it this way or not, they, they do effectively coordinate or share resources. Maybe not necessarily in purely collaborative ways, but it's a mix of you know cooperative and and competitive dynamics. And in a way, the state and the market provide us some substrates for cooperative and um, competitive dynamics at scale. But then the piece that's just missing is the is the the more personal less scaled dimension this civic sector this third sector and so yeah my hope is that um our our efforts to provide an alternative ontology are just going to um surface and support this third sector and and, and make sure that um people's needs are actually being met um not just like wiped aside because they're not scalable yeah I think one of the what I'm sort of getting from this is that uh, sort of I think the market and the state, but I would probably argue the market even more so, optimizes for what you said scale, efficiency, and probably convenience um, in certain respects. Um, also in inconvenience in, in in other respects as well. But like in in a capitalist system where like these things are being optimized for and uh, therefore needing to be scale, um, it creates these situations where people feel very alienated and where they have been sort of like untethered from, uh, I think what you mentioned previously, where in past decades we would have been, you know, members of these types of uh, organizations or groups of this third sector that don't scale or aren't meant to scale in the same way that uh, maybe markets or the state do. And so maybe I was thinking of like the network state um, this idea of uh, one commandment as being like this uh, community of solidarity uh, for someone who is very alienated within the system, maybe that sounds very that sounds very nice because then um, that's maybe like the first time that they're actually um, brought to like the reality that uh, they would like to be with other people who think like them. They're just thinking about it. It's just done in a way that is like very uh, surface level, I guess. <laughs> A machine learning analogy here is just dimensionality reduction, right? We have a big complex world. We're dealing with all of these dynamics. They're illegible and they seem to be out of our control. And our knee-jerk reaction is to sterilize it down to 1D. And you're like, okay, cool. I mean, like, I get why that's desirable. But ultimately, you know, if you lived in, you know, 1D is even less than flatland is 2D. Like, imagine living in flatland. Like, you really don't have any space left to, to, to express yourself or you can't encounter people who are differentiated from you because it's so low dimensional. And so what we're really hopefully giving people is a choose your own basis functions. Look, it's not one commandment, but here are... All excuse me. All of these different, um, you know, dimensions that are in the world, and I'm going to pick five or ten or fifteen, and I'm going to engage with those, and they're going to be legible, and I'm going to understand how they relate to me and my family and my friends, and I can make sense of the world in, you know, again, ten dimensions, but like, you know, like ten commandments, ten dimensions, right? Not like crazy out of, out, out you know. Um, out of this world stuff. People can man can handle that. And so it's just a bit like unbundling it. It's not like, okay, I select a, you know, you know, a, a Hebrew style religion and I get my Ten Commandments and these are the these are the commandments for everyone who who comes from this particular tradition. Um, it's more like, okay, well, I'm gonna have my own ten where one of them comes from each of the 
communities of solidarity that I've opted into. And if that's a sufficient set of, of communities to meet my needs, then I've reduced the complexity of my world to engaging with this, you know, order 10 uh, systems. But even those systems are unlikely to be truly reducible down to one dimension. But you kind of get the idea. It's like a local approximation thing. It's just that everybody's local approximation needs to be local to them. You can't have the local approximation be copy pasted across people who are not the same. Like if the people are differentiated, their local neighborhood in this universe will be different, but they'll be able to interact with people who share dimensions of solidarity, whether it's physical location, dependence on the same physical infrastructure that comes with that shared location, whether it's familial bonds, whether it's you know, technical or labor-oriented uh, bonds, we work together on something. Uh, there's a variety of different flavors of, of relationships that people might have, but I, I'm ultimately advocating for um, trying to reduce the complexity of the environment for people and to give them more control over where they express their, their diversity and then where also appropriate kind of compressing out of view the stuff that, um, that, they, that, that they're not interested in or don't need to contend with. Um, but that doesn't mean that like their network state is doing it for them. It might just mean, as is today, like there's a New York State Department of Transportation making sure that I have safe and reliable roads. Like is that, there's actually nothing wrong with that. That's very reasonable. I have effectively delegated my concern for the safety of the roads to them. And if I really have an issue, there's some communication channel somewhere through a public engagement office where I can say, hey, like this is a problem. Someone should look at it. And then someone who's reasonably qualified to look into it can. And ultimately, I'm not qualified to make that decision distinction anyway. I'm only really qualified to service the, surface the issue, but this ultimately relies on a, you know, an engineering institution as public service model, because if the engineering public, uh, you know, network state that's responsible for this is dictator and is not necessarily interested in my well-being, then they're just going to make cheap roads and bridges and they're going to fall down sometime and they're going to write that risk off on their actuarial tables. They're not going to actually care um, about the effects of their technical decisions on the people who are affected in any way other than some um, you know, monetary or power measurement. Right. I think the, um, there's like a uh, I mean, there's a question of like um, efficiency, but like efficiency for whom? And then uh, also like that sometimes something that is efficient in certain aspects is still insufficient in meeting people's needs. And yeah, I think sometimes there's like this uh, people have uh, have drank the Kool-Aid of uh, of, of the ideology of today to think that always efficiency is a good thing. Um, but one of the things that uh, I think that I really liked that you said was about thinking about sufficiency uh, and away from efficiency. Yeah, and so these concepts are actually quite formal. So even for people who really like formal, technical, quantitative stuff, when we talk about optimization problems, all optimization problems, they have an objective and they have constraints. That's the, the construct. The objective is the thing that you, sorry, say, maximize for. And the constraints are like requirements you need to meet. So all viable solutions or all feasible solutions satisfy the constraints. And so when we talk about efficiency, we're usually talking about improving the objective function. We're not necessarily talking about the satisfaction of the constraints. And in fact, we tend to push on the constraints and try to widen them out and make them more inclusive precisely because the more constrained the constraints are, the worse the objective function ends up being. This is like one of the main theorems in optimization theory. And what I'm sort of getting at here is that as long as we are optimizing rather than satisfying, we are going to be imposing a belief about what value is upon the system that we're optimizing and that we can sort of relax that a little bit and move towards what are called constraint satisfaction problems, which identify these requirements or the things that are necessary and strive to meet them without being quite so um, forward about you know, improving the 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 optimization object 
objective because we should would recognize the objective as being ultimately a subjective choice and that you might have a wide range of people reasoning with different objectives in mind. And if you go back and look at someone like Rawls and his social choice theory, he's actually using some of these same mathematical constructions. He talks about like... Um, sort of maximizing the minimum of a utility function where a group of people have different utilities. And the, and the reason that comes up is because even if you think you know people's utilities, you don't really. In fact, most people don't know their own utilities. So far be it from an economist to be able to claim that they know everyone's utilities. And These more expressive systems, they, they let go of this presumption that we can know what utility is and focus on... Um, on meeting sufficiencies. And then, you know, any particular local neighborhood can optimize for something. I'm not saying tech startups shouldn't optimize for revenue. I'm saying we shouldn't model everything after tech startups. Like, they're going <laughs> to behave, they're a species, and they're not a bad species. They're just one species. And our institutional ecology needs to be a lot more diverse. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, I think there's also a thing about, like, to which extent is it really efficient? Because I think, like, even from my, uh, like, beyond the fact that efficiency might come at the cost of um, effectiveness or however it's called, but uh, there is also, I think, quite an argument that um, a complete uh, disconnection and lack of interdependence is actually extremely inefficient because all of Sudan, you need to you need to rebuild everything from scratch. Like everyone, like there is no specialization possible. Uh, you cannot leverage on the work of others. So in fact, there is quite many efficiency that can be earned from putting things in commons and, uh, and accepting and actually embracing interdependencies for the sake of efficiency and possibly also for the sake of efficacy um, when well done. So it's like, it not only it's it's an argument that is only half an argument because it's not looking at the actual satisfaction of the condition, but I think it's even the argument of efficiency is not a very strong argument in this context. You have to draw a dotted line boundary about the system that you have in consideration. So whenever you're like analyzing or engineering quota system, you define both like the functions that is that that make it up and the boundaries of it to other systems. And so you're describing a situation where if we move the the dotted line boundary from an individual network state, which is trying to let's say efficiently serve all of its necessary functions, or we could open the boundary up to involve a variety of network states and the relationships amongst them such that they could share resources or share functions. The existing society works kind of like that, right? We have, let's say, a, um, I'll go back to the transportation system. So in the state of New York, there's a transportation bureau that serves the whole state, but there's also a bunch of municipalities, counties, et cetera, that are individually provisioning some of their local roads. And to some extent, the road system at the state level is coordinated amongst the local jurisdictions by the state level organization. And then you can recurse up to the United States and it has a federal transportation department and that helps coordinate the interactions of the um, um, the transportation systems, um, you know, amongst the states. And then if you really want to open it up, you can look at, the, you know, the kinds of institutions that manage things like air traffic control and look at the way that international flights are regulated. And what you're actually just going to find is a big, messy web of partially overlapping institutions at different scales, collectively producing a transportation network that allows me to hop on a flight and come visit you in France without really thinking about it twice. Is there anything left that you want to mention um, since we've reached about an hour? I just want to check uh, that you really want to talk about. I feel like we've hit the big bullet items. There's some stuff that I think will be really important for you guys to discuss, but um, that's coming up, I think, in the future. The, the the discussion of personal versus impersonal institutions and the extent to which they're complementary to each other. But I, I, I defer that topic to Eric because it's really his area of expertise, not mine. Okay. Is there any uh, last thing, Primavera, for you that you want to touch upon? Um, no, I think uh, I, I think this was quite of an interesting discussion. To, to me, like if I if I try to 
uh, dissect um, the the interesting some of the conclusion that we can use to build upon is um, the extent to which the the ideal uh, the ideal whether or not you might agree with not but the ideal of creating uh, a system that is a standalone system uh, because of the exit um, has some kind of beyond whether or not this is desirable for everyone uh, or for anyone, but uh, it also has this inherent, um, not conflict, but this inherent cost of not being able to benefit from the collective uh, management of infrastructure. And, and so if you do want to exit because you actually resonate with this ideal of I don't want to be associated with people that don't fully agree with me, um, then, then you have to incur this very additional cost of, well, then you have to deal with everything on your own as well and all the benefit of, well, you, you, might, you might escape from the cost of interdependence. You are also escaping from the benefit of interdependencies and I think this is kind of like a balance to be struck is like to which extent are the, the, the benefit of interdependence if properly managed and properly coordinated, uh, not obviously um, superior than the cost that might come with it. And, and again, I think like by just moving away, uh, that's, an, that's the easy solution, no more cost. But, uh, but also no more benefits, so great. Uh, easy question. And how do we actually structure this combination or coordination in such a way that we maximize the benefits while reducing the cost of this, this type of interdependencies? So I'm going to end then by kind of summarizing what I think is the, is the, the preliminary answer to your question. First is that we, we, we evoke the term network in the title, network state. However, if I throw away state for a moment and just focus on network, a network has a, um, a local neighborhood. It's nodes with edges. And there's ideally, with a nice, rich network, there's a non-trivial difference between any given node's neighborhood. Like it's got different edges in it. And so when we go to the really sterile extreme, what we're effectively doing is trying to cut out a node and making it totally self-contained. So it's not... Um, it's not getting served and not serving any other nodes. In the other extreme, we have a what I'll call a, an overly dense network, a network that is so dense that the both at the institutional and individual level, it's just cognitive overload. I have so many edges. We've passed my Dunbar's number or my organizations are trying to manage far too many relations. And I think some of this is just the modern world rapidly digitizing and the creation of all of these new tools, widgets, things that are just demanding our attention. They want to be used. They want to be governed. They want to be interacted with. They're not infrastructures because they're not invisible. They're in, up in our face. And so when we get this overload of interactions with, with people and objects and institutions, we're retreating to the other extreme. But in the middle is the actual thing, network, which has got these local... Um, neighborhoods. And so what I'm imagining is a new ontology that is actually networked in the sense that it has a, a local nodes where an individual or an individual um, community could be a node. And that the extent to which that community has relations, whether it's co-membership or shared resources with other communities, you get an edge. And simply reimagining the world with a, a kind of proper network ontology and the understanding that the size of a neighborhood needs to remain bounded, even if it's not you know, zero or one, um, leads us to a, a view of the world that we could, we could build towards, that we could like practically embody by building these supporting infrastructures for these coordinations or these units of solidarity, like enabling them to constitute and interoperate. So, so not just constitute and operate individually, but constitute and, and interoperate. And just to be clear, I don't necessarily mean constitute in terms of write a formal um, constitution. I mean in the sense of 
you know, create and maintain boundaries. So like the, like constitution, like of your body, like it's embodied. They can come to be recognizable as a thing. And that, that could be something as simple as, you know, your bowling league, right? You don't necessarily need to form an LLC or launch a DAO to form a, a group of friends that, um, you know, competes at bowling every Tuesday for, you know, whatever, six months, and then maybe disperses and does the next thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's interesting in this uh, framework is that we are already, whatever the name of this thing is, it's already here. It's just unnamed and there is just many different instances and we don't recognize them as being part of the same constellation of units. And therefore, we don't even think that they can be networked together. And I think if we manage to find this right meme and, uh, and all of a sudden shed light on the fact that those are things that have been happening since ever and continue to happen despite their invisibility because of lack of a vocabulary. Um, and then the, the performativity of the language, which all of a sudden, because now we, we perceive those things as being part of nodes of a potential broader network, we can choose to which extent do we want to connect or disconnect with those specific units. And this is actually why I felt like I really wanted to come here and talk to you guys is because I view the performity of performativity of language as being central here and that the network state book is sort of jumping out and trying to um, invite a particular future with a particular choice of words and, and uh, an ontology. And I, I just, you know, I'm resistant to the, what was articulated and I wanted to work with you guys to sort of tease out what that, um, what that alternative would be. But to your point, P, it's, I think it comes down to finding the right words to make visible, to make legible what I see as the reincarnation of the civic center, excuse me, the civic sector in technological um, uh, like forms. So like the technology and the internet period has given us a new set of tools, a new set of materials. And what I see is people using those tools and materials to, um, to, to re-articulate or to reimagine what the civic sector can and should be, this thing that is not the state and is not the market. Right. And I think we need to move away from this, uh, this vision that like digital communities are blank social networks, uh, which do not have this collective action, which don't have these collective resources and so forth, and really like try to reformalize uh, what does an actual digital community looks like. And that clearly does not look like a Facebook group or a Twitter thread. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that and once, we've, once we've formalize this, I think automatically the tools for actually improving the management of those digital communities but, will have But we out. can't we can't exclude from our ontology geographically local communities. So for me, the Absolutely. one of those big misses on Balaji's part was a, a failure to understand the the relationship to the the physical local. And so when we build this new ontology, it needs to be able to bring both these sort of digital collective action things and so these communities of sol solidarity that are cross-cutting and these ones that are locally anchored they need to be they need to be in the same ontology they need you, i need to be part of both at the same time and have one thing serve one set of needs while the other serves another set of needs and again for me that's very much my experience of you know coming home with my family and starting to reintegrate with my local social infrastructures while maintaining and even expanding my relationships in my digital first professional relationships in, and and um, uh, to to the defense of Balaji, <laughs> I'm surprised <laughs> I'm intervening in that sense. But to the defense oh, no. of Balaji, actually, because he, he is actually talking, he, in some way, he's, he's thinking about the, the local because he actually wants to purchase territory and declare independence so that we can all live together, which... To his defense, that's interesting. We need to think about the local. And I think some of the mistakes that a lot of, uh, you know, digital community, global, global community um, discourse actually forget is the, is the local aspect of, of those. And, and so 
you know, you 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 can be part of millions of digital community, but you forget that there is also the local bonds and the local infrastructure. And and I think to 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 respond to what you're saying about it, it needs to be part of the same ontology. To me, it's very it's very simply that whatever is the communication, if we want to call it like this, there is one that you just cannot extrapolate yourself away from, which is your locally, like if we, if we consider communication as bonds and, and relationality between people that have a similar interest or something in common, then there is one of those which you do have, you cannot escape it. You have something in common, you're on the same physical space. And that's just the nature of the relationship is physicality as opposed to ideology, as opposed to solidarity and so forth. And we cannot forget about that one. And this is kind of the one that no matter what, you have no choice. Well, you have the choice to move somewhere else, but no matter what, you will have a community of relations that are based on who has chosen to live next to you. Yeah. So what's interesting about this is that there's actually a relatively clean way to align these, and it's, it's simply attention. So when we when you're in physical space with someone and you're paying attention to something else. They'll say you're off in the clouds or, oh, he's not here, right? Because what they're actually talking about when we say you're here is that your attention is localized with the other people who are physically present with you. You're working together on a thing, you're conversing, you're sharing a meal or whatever it is that you're doing in physical space. And even in digital space, sure, you can have a hundred tabs open, but you can only pay attention to so much at once. And so I think there's something really salient to thinking about both digital and physical um, you know, communities of solidarity or groupings in terms of co-locating attention. And then I can even reason about whether I'm you know, online doing a podcast with you guys versus going upstairs and you know, giving my daughter lunch. Like I'm taking my attention and I'm moving it between allocations to my, you know, digital coordination that's interested in coordination and my physical sort of familial localized unit, both of which are obligations that I feel to my, you know, to my communities, to my, to the, these parts of my identity. And I don't need to like segment them harshly. I can just say, well, these are these share this local constrained resource, my attention, and I'm going to make decisions about how I partition that attention across these um, th these dimensions. Nice. Yeah. Even though I was um, a little bit offended when you mentioned uh, people having hundreds of tabs open, <laughs> I took it personally. <laughs> now looking at my browser with hundreds of tabs open, um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Talk to you, uh, Zargam. Uh, maybe if we can just um, to end it off, if you wanted to leave us uh, any last thoughts, of course, and where people can keep up with you and your work. I guess final thoughts is thanks for, for listening to my thoughts. Um, you can keep up with me. I'm M. Zargam on Twitter, and I have the Block Science blog, which is both on Medium and on, uh, we, ha we put a ghost blog up to sort of you know, disintermediate, but we keep going to the Medium, which just goes to tell you that convenience seems to dominate. Um, but yeah, those are probably the two best places to keep up with me. All right, great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Zagam. So